Welcome to Computer Networks. This is Lecture 10. As we just discussed, Homework 5 is due this week. And um, most of you are almost done, it seems like. But if you have any questions, um, I'll give you one more minute to think about any questions you might have. Just wanted to make a note about homework deadlines. The Wednesday night deadlines are soft deadlines. Sorry, there was some confusion. Um, there are two confusions. One, you know, how hard or how soft it is. I'm not going to give you any numbers other than to tell you that it's a soft deadline. And what I, and the reason why it's soft is um, if, you, if you're just late by 15 minutes or something like that, or maybe in an hour or two, it just doesn't make sense to uh, penalize you for that. Because the point is to learn the material, know how to do the task that I ask you to do, rather than finish it exactly at that time, especially now when you're learning. But don't push it too much because most likely the following morning we're going to take a snapshot and at that time the homework has to be in. Another confusion about homework deadlines is on Blackboard, it'll just say Friday midnight. And we've set it Friday midnight because we want to let you withdraw the homework and submit it again if you want to do that. If we set the deadline to be Wednesday night, then you won't be able to resubmit. So even though the Blackboard system says it's Friday midnight, the actual deadline is Wednesday night. Any questions? And we'll try to stick to that schedule just so that uh, you know, the deadlines don't change arbitrarily throughout the semester. And there'll be at least one or two weeks when we don't have homework due. <laughs> Especially the Wednesday after exam, uh, that's the time to breathe. Okay? All right. And I'll post uh, exam one practice problems later today. You don't have to turn them in, uh, but I encourage you to just look at all of them, try to solve them, and if you have any questions, we can discuss that on Wednesday. Okay. Did you think of any questions to ask about homework five? Yeah. Uh, can we use a WGAN or code in the uh, for which part? For question one. For question one. Even in question one, there are many parts. Uh, for for wh which task within question? To send a header request. To send a header request? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that'll be fine. You, c you can use uh, whatever you want. Did everyone understand that question? Yeah. So the question was, can we use wget <coughs> to get header response, I guess? That'll be fine. Because here now we're transitioning into the phase where rather than me telling you, okay, you have to use this tool, you have to use that tool, and you have to determine what the best tool is for you. It depends on the person, depends on what you're familiar with. So we're transitioning into that phase now. And you can use various scripts. If you, if you want to automate some of these tasks. If you don't automate this task, this is going to take forever. So if you haven't uh, thought about automating, um, basically understanding the headers that are being sent by the servers, it's, it's going to be a, maybe a few long days. <laughs> and um, if I'm doing the homework, I noticed that there are a few uh, websites that doesn't, that doesn't include the the server header in the response, and there are some websites that doesn't exist. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so the question was, there are some servers that don't return their identity, and there are some sites um, to which you're not able to send a request, or from which you're not able to get a response. What to do? I don't know. <laughs> Just think of this as a task that you had to do. Uh, let's say you had to write up a report saying what is the most popular web server or what are the popular web servers used by popular websites. Uh, you have to make a judgment. And uh, the servers that don't return the identity, that could be because maybe it's a custom server that they built in-house. I don't know. Maybe you have better ideas than me. Because I don't know all the answers. But if, you, if your approach is reasonable, that's what I'm looking for. 
I'm looking for reasonable answers rather than correct answers because I don't know the correct answer. One thing you could do is, if, especially if it is a technology-oriented company, um, so th this, is, this, is, this is how you have to think when you solve problems in the real world, right? If it is a technology-oriented company, it's possible that they have discussed in various interviews what technology they use. They might even have said that uh, they built a server in-house. It's possible. Right? When engineers or CTOs go for interviews, sometimes uh, they might say things like that. Any other questions? So how about question, the, the second question in the homework? Did you get a chance to? Yeah, think? can you elaborate on this? I mean, I mean uh, uh, yeah, we have to calculate the moving average windows, of, of window size one. But, uh, I, I'm, I'm still not clear about that part. I see. First of all, uh, let me just uh, briefly describe what the second problem asks you to do. Basically, it takes a snapshot of bytes transmitted and received on a network interface. And uh, when I was taking these snapshots, I was also doing some file transfers in one direction. Now, when I start transferring the files, the rate at which the number of bytes change the the bytes the increase in the number of bytes across the snapshots you, you should be able to see a significant increase right especially i think the first trace is pretty obvious but if you just look at each sample there is a significant jitter you won't get a high level longer term trend and that's the reason you have to take average because there could be instantaneous variation in the network capacity, for example. And if you just look at these very fine-grained snapshots, you won't be able to see a larger trend. And that's the reason I'm asking to take a snapshot, uh, take the average. Um, just to relate that to uh, something that we might uh, relate to more easily. Um, let's say you, when you're driving your car on the freeway, if I ask you what was the speed, what is your answer? Give me, give me a possible answer. How fast were you driving? 65 Oh, you guys are all wrong. <laughs> you guys are not driving at 65 miles per hour. You guys, you guys are probably driving with a variety of speeds between 64.5 and 64.6, maybe 100 different speeds. So you get the idea, right? If you're looking at very fine-grained data, sometimes it's hard to see the bigger picture. I have a question regarding the moving average. It's like a, yeah. because it's like a, I guess it's a detailed question, but. Mm -hmm. For like the first point, I mean, do we take do we take a moving average for that point? It's just it consists of the one point, and then for the second one, we have because you want ten the window size is ten, right? Yeah. So like for the beginning and the end, like the window size is, well, I guess the the end will be okay. But. Yeah. So you're talking about not just first, the first sample, but the first uh, nine samples. What to do? Yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. Right. Do we take them just? I mean, do we just not start the moving average until the tenth one? It's up to you. But I think you understand the problem. That's, that's, the, that's the important part here. If you really want to be, really don't want to throw away that data, you actually need to use smaller window sizes so that your numbers aren't off. Because you're going to divide by one second, right? So when you compute, you know, what's the average transfer in the first uh, nine-tenth of a second? You need to divide by nine-tenth, not one second. Does it make sense to everyone? So uh, we're trying to compute the average number of bytes transmitted during each one second window. But let's say we're looking at the first in a half second. We don't have one second worth, worth of data. And the question, question was what to do about that. And the answer is it's up to you.
And what that suggests is the initial data is probably not very helpful, where it's warming up our system. Any other question? So one challenge that you will find is even though I've asked you about one or a small number of file transfers, there is some other transfer that's happening in the background that I don't know about because it's a computer that's connected to the internet running various things. So there is going to be some noise in the background. By noise, what I mean is there is something that's happening in the background that I haven't told you about. And if you do moving averages like what we discussed, you should be able to just look at these salient trends. You'll notice that there is some transfer happening even before there is something big that happens, a certain number of seconds in, into the trace. Any other questions? Yeah, I, I would say spend some time thinking about automation because I will ask you to do similarly large number of mundane tasks in future assignments as well. Just to give you a preview, I will ask you to compute latency across thousands of links, across a large number of machines. So I think it's uh, nice to start thinking about how to automate some of these very simple tasks. So if you don't have previous experience with shell <coughs> scripting, uh, it might be a good idea to learn that. A lot of people find it easier to do some of these scripts using Perl. So who has not done Perl or Shell or Python programming? OK. So how do you plan to automate this? Because we're going to have to learn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because this is a, sort of a real world problem, right? Sometimes you'll be asked to write reports on, OK, can you do a survey across these 10,000 sites? And you don't want to do overtime for that. <laughs> You want to understand how to solve one small piece of problem and focus most of your effort into automating that, detecting the cases that cannot be automated, and also making an adjustment as to how much effort you want to spend automating things. Right? So let's say your automation script does not handle these two cases. It might take you two hours of programming to also handle them, or it might take you maybe five minutes to actually do those two small tasks manually. All right, so if you have more questions, uh, please uh, post them on the discussion board. And uh, please you know, help each other about uh, um, some of these homework assignments. All right, so um, let's uh, get going with transfer protocols. We've been talking about TCP for a few lectures, and uh, we're going to conclude our discussion in the next lecture, actually. We're going to focus on two ideas today. One is called TCP friendliness and another is not just thinking about the end host, that's what we've been doing so far, but also thinking about what is the role of network if there is one uh, when we think about congestion control and congestion avoidance. First a brief recap on how TCP works. Just want you to Look at the diagram on the left. Here we have TCP that tries to send a full window worth of packets into the network. And we, we understood that this is a bad idea because we're going to drop the packets and we're going to wait a long time to retransmit another one because we're overwhelming the network. And the inefficiency is basically lack of transmitted packets due, during significant time intervals. For example, on this diagram, we can see that we're not able to transmit any packet between about half a second into the experiment until about maybe one and a half seconds. You, you, you can see that, right? And if this doesn't make sense, uh, you can go look at the videos from earlier lectures when we went uh, through this in a little bit more detail. Instead of sending entire window worth of packets into the network, if you pace it carefully, then we, we get a we get the scenario that we're showing on the right-hand side. Uh, the key difference between these two diagrams is the scale of y-axis. We're able to send many more packets when we're, when we're pacing the 
and we're pacing the packets. This might seem counterintuitive because in the earlier case, we're sending as many packets as possible, very aggressive, but in the end, we actually lost. All right. Then we talked about RTT estimation. Let's just look at this diagram. Each dot corresponds to, a, to an RTT sample. Right? When we transmit a packet, we get an ACK, and then we measure the difference between the transmission time and the reception time. And that's an RTT, right? That's the round trip time. How long, how long did it take? You will notice that it's not very stable. It just jumps up and down. If we're using RTT as one piece of information that determines when we're injecting packets into the network, this could be problematic. Right? Because the signal is jumping all over the place. The question is, can we come up with a smoother version of this signal that we can more reliably use as information that we can feed into our congestion control algorithm? And that's when we started talking about EWMA, taking some sort of average so that we have a handle on larger trends rather than just looking at each sample. Uh, for example, if I just look at this diagram, if I asked you, what is the RTT around 55th packet? It's hard to answer. It could be 4, it could be 10, right? If we take an average, that gives us a better sense for what is the bigger trend here. And you get to explore EWMA in the context of the homework as well. We talked about how TCP paces packets when it detects congestion. The way TCP detects congestion is by how is congestion signaled? Any, any ideas? How does TCP know that network is congested? Uh, lost packets or timeout when trying to do the yeah. timeouts are also lost packets, right? Or lost ACK. Yeah. Right. So if you don't receive an ACK, TCP takes that as a signal that the network is congested. The old TCP used to do another slow start when it detects the congestion. And it's uh, inefficient because we're not using the network uh, to as much as we should. And uh, there was an optimization that we talked about. It's called fast retransmit. Rather than start at the bottom, we actually just have it and then start doing additive increase. Do people remember this or no? I haven't said anything new, right? Okay, then I will say something new now. So let's explore this idea of TCP friendliness. Now we we learn, we, we know how TCP works, how it paces packets at various stages. In the beginning, when there is a congestion, and when it's a recovering from packet drops, right? In the internet, we not only have TCP, but something called UDP. That's another transfer, pro uh, transfer protocol popular for certain types of applications. Can you tell me what type of applications might prefer to use UDP as opposed to TCP? Voice communication. Yeah, for example, voice communication. Why do they use UDP and not TCP? It's OK if you have a lost package. Or... Yeah. Yeah, so they, their requirements are slightly different in terms of what is important to the application. Rather than aim for perfect reliability in those applications, it's important to have fresh data rather than recover data from two seconds ago if you're doing a real-time voice application. Right? In the TCP world, that one packet that was lost two seconds ago, that's very important. Right, we're trying to deliver all the packets reliably. So there are some applications that have slightly different requirements in terms of reliability. Of course, uh, 
even voice communication applications, they don't want packets to be dropped randomly. But it's, it's useless to recover packets from two seconds ago. That's kind of the key thing here. Of course, you want to be as reliable as possible. Otherwise, we won't be able to communicate in voice, right? So the question is, how can we have UDP coexist with TCP? What is the potential problem? Why are we even talking about this? What's the main difference between TCP and UDP? TCP is guaranteed delivery. So that's one, guaranteed delivery. TCP guarantees delivery, UDP does not. So we talked about a lot of mechanisms about TCP. What are they geared towards? It's connection oriented. And also, why, why did we talk about all these mechanisms related to TCP? We talked about, we spent two or three lectures, right, talking about various mechanisms. But do you know why is that? Why is that important? It's not just for fun. Because we want, um, one of the reasons is because we want everyone to be able to use the internet, not just you know, one person taking up all the bandwidth, right? So there is some notion of fairness. And we also want to be able to adapt to how the network is at a given time. That's, that's, that's another reason. Why is that important? Because we don't want to overwhelm the network. When the network is stressed, we want to reduce our rate. And when the network is able to deliver lots of packets, we, we want to send lots of packets, right? UDP does not have those mechanisms. In UDP, you just send the packet. It's very simple. It does not guarantee reliability. It's a best effort protocol. That's the term that they use. You try your best, but you don't uh, try extra hard to recover lost packets. And you don't control the rate at which you inject the packets into the network. So what's the problem? if we try to use TCP and UDP at the same time? UDP is going to keep on sending stuff and TCP is going to get choked off. Yeah. But why would TCP get choked off? Now just think back to all the mechanisms that we discussed. You should be able to explain that now. So let's say we have TCP and UDP sending packets at the same time. UDP does not paste its packets, or at least the way TCP does. So what happens at the routers, or at the receiver, let's say? You get a ton of UDP packets and very few TCP packets. Yeah. And what happens to the TCP packets coming in, if you have tons of UDP packets? The routers and stuff like that, and just drop packets. Yeah. So we're going to drop a bunch of UDP packets and a bunch of TCP packets, right? So how does TCP respond when a bunch of TCP packets are dropped? What does TCP think? And then what does TCP do? It slows it down. What does UDP do? It keeps going. And what happens uh, for the next round of TCP packets? And then what do, how does TCP respond to that? It will slow down further, right? So do, you, do you see the problem? It uh, shows it the graph here as well. If we have number of flows and one is UDP, it's going to be very greedy. It's clear the, pro the problem. So how do we solve this problem? So that's what we're going to talk about. So let's say you want to write a video streaming application using UDP. How, how do you paste the packets? That's what we're talking about. Let's say we, t we said earlier that if you want real-time voice communication application, you might want to use UDP for certain reasons. But it turns out you shouldn't send all the packets that you have into the network. Right? Otherwise, it's going to cause a lot of problems. So the question is, how should you paste the packets for something like UDP? So this idea called equation-based congestion control is one way to tackle that problem. And at a high level, the idea is, although we're not going to use TCP's congestion control algorithm, 
we come up with a way to estimate the rate at which we should be sending packets if uh, the protocol that we're using is TCP. And that's what the equation is all about. So you have this equation that tells you, okay, this is the rate at which I should be sending the packets into the network. So that's the high-level idea. Does that make sense? So we said the idea is we write this mathematical equation that captures the behavior of TCP so that even though we're not TCP, would behave as if we're TCP so that we don't starve all the TCP flows. If you think about how TCP adjusts its rate, what does that depend on? These three factors, right? We talked about loss. We talked about loss, how that impacts uh, the rate. How about RTT? How does RTT impact the rate of TCP? Well, if it takes too long to get, to get your request back, basically, then you're going to time out. So it's going to, the, the packet got lost. Yeah, so first of all, you might time out. Think about the rate at which TCP increases the sending rate. Let's say from, let's, let's focus on slow start. How quickly does it change the rate? Does round trip time come into play there? You increase the number of packets that you're sending when you receive an ACK. Right? Now round trip time determines when you receive an ACK. If it is a end-to-end -end link with a large RTT, you're going to wait a long time to increase the rate. How about MSS? What does MSS stand for? Maximum segment. Maximum segment. How does that change the rate or number of bytes you're sending into the network? Let's say you have a small MSS. And let's think back slow start again. <coughs> we're sending smaller packets, right? So that changes the rate at which or the number of bytes we're sending into the network. So these are three main factors that determine the rate at which TCP sends packets. Now, if you write a mathematical equation to capture TCP's behavior, these three are going to be the primary variables in that equation. So if these three are the most important parameters, then we need a way to estimate these values at a given time for us to understand, OK, what, what would have been the TCP rate? Right? So we have a voice communication application, but we need to be able to estimate these. Right? Can you tell me how you might estimate RTT if you're writing a voice communication application? You might have some kind of ACK, right? You might, you might need to do that. That's the only way to estimate that. How about loss? The receiver might give some feedback to the sender saying, OK, here's the current loss rate. So when you're writing voice communication application, we need to estimate these quantities. And once we have a reasonably good estimate. We can plug them in the equation and know, okay, what would have been the TCP rate given these values? And that's the rate at which these applications will inject the packets, or applications should inject the packets, because we want this application to be TCP friendly. All right. Let's think about TCP throughput. First of all, at a given time, that equation gives you the sending rate. Right? We're sending that many bytes every RTT. W is window MSS we already talked about. What happens if there is a drop? Reduce the window. Right? 
once we reduce the window in half, how quickly do we increase the window? We increase by, we said one every round trip. It's, it's not like slow start. Remember that, right? So what's the average rate in that case? So we have at the maximum you know, that sending rate. And at the minimum, we're talking about uh, stable state, exactly half of that. So it's about 0 0.75. That's the average rate. Does, any questions here? It's pretty straightforward, right? You have a window size of W. You decrease that at some point and continue to increase that linearly. And then once you hit the window size W, you cut that in half again. Why are we cutting it into half? Because we exceeded the capacity. And once you exceed the capacity, there will be at least one packet drop. And when there is one packet drop, the sender knows that there is one packet drop. You decrease the capacity into half. right? And because it's linear, it's uh, exactly half the average rate. So what's the loss rate? What is the loss rate? I'll give you the equation, but uh, you should at least uh, have an intuitive feel for how you might compu compute that. So we've lost one packet, right? Over how many packets? Because that is how we compute the loss rate. So can you tell me at least informally what is the loss rate? And I'll give you the equation. So we've lost one packet. And how many packets did we send? S times R But that's just in a one. We don't go from W over 2 to W in one RTT, right? So let's say we've dropped a packet. We're at W over 2. Right? And we send that many packets, and then we increase the window to W over 2 plus 1. Right? And then we do plus 1 again. So every RTT, we're increasing the window by 1. So how many total packets? W. W is, we're just sending W in one round trip, right? Let's think about that. So how many round trip time does it take for the rate to go from W over 2 to W? W over 2. Because you're increasing 1 each time. So yeah. So it takes, at least now we agree that it's not one round trip time. No, it's, no. It's, it's a certain large number of round trip times. So right. you get from W over 2 to W, you mm -hmm. have to do it, if you're adding 1 each time, then you have to do it W over 2 times. Okay. So now we're going in the right direction. So it turns out that equation actually gives you precisely, you know, how many packets we sent when we increased our window from W over 2 to W, and then we lost one packet. We're assuming that uh, we detect that and then we decrease the rate. Um, no need to write it down because it's on the slide. You'll have the slides. So let's see what's going on. Uh, maybe I'll show you the next one. So um, we know that that's the loss rate, right? It's expressed in terms of W. It's not as simple as you thought, but you're in the right direction, by the way. Okay. So that's the loss rate. Now, if you rearrange the terms and do elementary algebra, you get, get an expression for a W. All right? Now, remember we had average rate expressed in terms of W? And if we substitute that, we get the throughput equation. So do you get an intuition for how throughput equation is derived? 
Okay, good. So before we can use the throughput equation to determine the rate at which we should inject packets, we need to be able to plug in some numbers to those variables. But we already talked about how to estimate RTT, right? We already talked about how to estimate loss. There is a cooperation between the sender and the receiver. So if you plug them in, we'll, we'll find out you know, what is a TCP-friendly rate at a given time. And the reason we're talking about TCP-friendly rate is because we don't want our UDP flow to starve the rest of the TCP flows in the system. Everything in one screen over here. Okay. So if you look at the throughput equation, you will notice that throughput is inversely proportional to the square root of loss. So the type of loss that we've been talking about so far is nothing to do with the network, right? It's basically at the receiver, you know, when you drop a packet because the sender is trying to send too many packets, we're calling that a loss. But this also gives you an intuition for what, what will happen if you run TCP over lossy links. Certain links are not very lossy, and some links are lossy. Can you give me an example of lossy links? What are they? Wireless. Wireless, yeah. Wireless, you get a lot of loss, right? So what happens to TCP throughput when you run TCP over wireless? So this, this will tell, this, you should be able to, because we're basically capturing how TCP works with this equation, right? So if you're running TCP over wireless links, what should you expect? Slow. slow. Why is it slow? Because the, increases your yeah, exactly. And we run TCP, right, over wireless. Most of the applications use TCP. So hopefully this will get, give you some insight as to what's happening. Um, I, did I miss a step? How did we get from loss rate to loss? Is loss just one over loss rate? Yeah. Our loss here is basically, you will, uh, oh. so you, you see 1 over 3 over 8, yep. W square, and then 8 over 3. All right, any, any question? I think you should... Uh, it's not necessary for you to know how to derive these equations from first principles, even for the exam, because you have the, you know, if you think this is important, you just write it down. I don't want you to memorize it. Everyone knows that, right? You're allowed to uh, bring uh, one page of notes to the exam. This was announced on the first day, <laughs> but it was a very crowded day. I, I, I can understand. Yeah, you're allowed to bring up Phase of notes to the exam, and if you, you know, why burden yourself learning how to derive this? But I want you to get an intuition for where some of these ideas are coming from and why. That's the point. So what happens to TCP throughput when we have different levels of loss? This is what I'm trying to show you with these diagrams. You can see that you achieve a higher rate, higher throughput, if you run TCP over links that are not very lossy. Another thing I expect you to totally understand at this point is why are we seeing this sawtooth behavior? Can you tell me why we're seeing this sawtooth behavior? It's pretty simple. It's elementary at this point, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. Wouldn't it be smarter to yeah, so there are various uh, schemes that don't cut into half, and we'll talk very briefly one of those ideas in the next lecture. So TCP has gone through many, many revisions, and uh, 
the clear problem with this kind of uh, oscillation. We're not using the network uh, you know, in full capacity. Yeah. When you let's say you do <coughs> implement that the application, the voice application over UDP, do you mm -hmm. have to take into account? Do you have to like mm -hmm. create that congestion control algorithm? Um, you're not required to, right? No, no one is saying, okay, we're not going to install your app if you don't do that. But yeah, let's think about it. That's a, that's a very important question. I mean, so what's the incentive? Or yeah. So if you're very greedy, what should you do? Let's say you have a voice control application and you want to sell it to all of your users saying, oh, it's really fast. You can do very high quality video. What should you do? Yeah. Okay. So that's the you know obvious greedy behavior, right? Now let's say you have two of your users running this application. If you have that behavior, what's going to happen? It, even your own application, two instances of it, might run into trouble because they're just too aggressive, right? So it seems like even if you want to be very selfish. You shouldn't be too aggressive here. Do people understand that? All right. So if we have lossy links, we're going to see lower throughput on TCP. You probably experience this uh, you know, at home. If you also have wired or option to have wired connection at home, you'll see that you have uh, better through, but even though the access point is the same, the internet access, uh, internet service is the same. All right? So how can we solve this problem? That's what we're going to talk about for maybe a minute. So we know that uh, when TCP sends too many packets beyond the capacity of the network, the right behavior is to send fewer packets. That's clear, right? We, we had some disagreement about, uh, about you know, how much you should lower the rate. Maybe half is maybe too much, right? But that's a minor point in my opinion. But I think there is an agreement that maybe you should slow down, right? What, what's it, what is the right behavior if there is a packet drop because of channel you know, loss? These are two different types of losses, right? One is we've exceeded the capacity. Another is we haven't exceeded the capacity, so that the channel is very lossy. Do people understand the difference? This is an important distinction. Different type of loss. Does TCP know the difference? No, it just says, OK, I didn't receive an ACK. Must be a congestion. Let me reduce the window into half. So what do you think uh, uh, should, what, what should we do to TCP to handle the situation? If we don't do something, TCP is going to work really poorly over wireless. Because the capacity might be large, but uh, it's going to drop packets once in a while, or more often than wire networks, for example. So what should we do to TCP? Out what the cause was. Yeah, so that's the bullet point down here. So one option is to tell the sender that, okay, this is a loss, but this is not related to congestion, in which case there is no reason to slow down. Right? Another approach, or another possibility, is to mask those losses. Because, remember, these packets are being dropped for reasons that are unrelated to the capacity. So we can have lower layers of the stack. Actually, we retransmit the packet multiple times. Remember, we have not exceeded the capacity of the network. right? And we retransmit the packet multiple times so that the packet is delivered reliably. Understand these two approaches? Which one is better? All right, something for you to think about. But let's uh, take a quick break. And we're going to move on to some other topics. Still congestion control, but some other topics. All right?
So if you have any questions about homework or anything, have to um, discuss. I have our yeah. Okay. Uh, how do you approximate partition? How do you approximate partition? Okay. Um, you can tell the receiver that I'm going to send you a packet. Well, I mean the equation. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know. Oh. So you can send a packet to the receiver, but tell the receiver that bounce that packet as quickly as you can. Why is that? Why do you want the receiver to bounce the packet? Because you want to see how long it takes to have a virtual uh, receiver. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. The other thing is, I think you missed it, but uh, how do you estimate loss? Yeah, because that's the other thing. Basically, you can tell the receiver that yeah, I'm going to send you 10 packets. Yeah. Tell me how many you receive. That we want to Yeah. Just like pinging them. Yeah. You get a percent model. Yeah. Exactly. I thought round trip time is supposed to take into effect, uh, take into account the, the congestion at the server as well. Uh, depends on exactly what you're trying to do. Because when you say bounce a packet as fast as possible, that may not actually take into account really the true round trip time if you're going to continue accessing that service over and over and over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it depends on what you're trying to do with the round trip. Just <laughs> tell if you want a really good round trip, yeah. it sounds good. Yeah. 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 So if you're, trying, if you're trying to understand the network round trip time, okay. then let's say you're only interested in the delay on the length of the If you're trying to understand how long it takes to I mean, um, do some meaningful work and get a response, for example, Let's say if you want to understand how long it takes, uh, okay, let me rephrase that. If you want to understand what the user experience is like in terms of browsing, in that case, it makes sense to also take a look at for the server to process the request, generate the response, and send it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My, my It'd be a good way to figure out the server. Yeah. Yeah. Say that again. You're saying, like, um, yeah. try to decipher, like, once some of these servers don't go to the homework, it's going to start to uh, yeah. attack the server. Well, you could well, over the different yeah. things. Yeah. Like, if you, if you could say the network is available on the system, or yeah. Yeah. look at the run for Scott when you take a book back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Same um, so basically, you're trying to decide when to time out. If you send like send like a large request to the server to make sure that it has to do something on it, yeah, process it. Yeah, you could compare that round trip time to the servers that you do know. So you're trying to find out what is the processing delay. Yeah, yeah, yeah you can do that. Is that consistent across the types of servers? Uh, it might not be. That's the thing. Yeah. Some of these things become very complex. Yeah. Well, well, I, had, I, had very a, yeah, I have an idea that might be the yeah. might be very simple. So when you get down to it, especially if you want to really understand some of these issues very accurately. Is it okay to use PHP for things? Yeah, as long as you can buy it and buy it. Are you a PHP programmer? No, but my friend and I kind of came up with something. Okay. And, uh, it was like, it was like literally like 10 lines ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, whatever helps you get the work done as uh, quickly as possible. Together. Yeah. You need to glue them, yeah. 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 All right, let's. Uh, Let's start. Okay. Um, do you get a sense to think about any other homework questions? No? How do you do it? Say it again? No, I'm just checking. Oh, okay. How do you do it? All right. No homework questions? Okay. All right. So we've talked about how to paste the packets purely based on information at the ends. The ends being the sender and the receiver. That's, that's all we've talked about so far. So we're going to talk about something slightly different. 
And there's another thing that we talked about, which is uh, how to respond to congestion after the congestion has already happened. Right? That we've already exceeded the capacity of the network, we've dropped the packet, and uh, how to respond to that. So we're going to talk about how to actually predict that the congestion is building up. Why is that useful? Because it lets us pull back earlier and so not have to hit that yeah. multiplicative feature. Right, right. You'll contribute to it to make it worse. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We can do better if we can predict that uh, there's an imminent congestion. And we're also going to talk about the role of network, the role of elements that are in the network, rather than just the end hosts. So first, let's talk about this idea of trying to estimate that we're getting into this saturated domain. We're saturating the network. There's an imminent congestion so that we can back off a little bit. Right. So on the top, we have something that looks very familiar, right? That's the window. The second diagram is actually the number of bytes sent. Remember, you're clocking the segments in TCP, right? You transmit one segment and when you receive an ACK. We talked about conservation of flow. So what's, uh, what's going on? The window is increasing. We said we increase the window every time we receive an ACK. It's an additive increase, right, in the stable regime. But we're not able to send as many packets. What's going on? How can we explain that? In the second graph? <laughs> yeah. How can we explain that? First of all, we understand the two graphs, right? One is window. We, we've already studied the algorithm. The second graph is the number of bytes we're actually able to send. Why are they different? So what does congestion window tell you? Okay, this is the maximum I'm allowed to send. But you're still sending the packets every time you receive, a pa receive an ACK, right? So what's the, what's the difference? It turns out we're not receiving acts fast enough, and that's why we're not able to send the packets fast enough, even though our congestion window tells us that we can send a lot more packets. Understand the difference? Why could that happen? The third diagram should explain that. So the third diagram is the queue size. When the congestion window increases beyond a certain amount, that means we're sending more and more packets into the network, at some point, the number of packets that are queued up builds up, right? Then why does the sending rate, why, why does it flatten when the queue builds up? Think about X. So when the packets are queued in the router, What's happening to the rate at which the receiver is sending X? It's constant, basically, based on how fast the router gets pumped up. Yeah. We're not sending X faster anymore. We're sending packets faster. That's why the queue is building up, right? But we're not receiving X at a faster rate. So if we're not receiving the X at faster rate, what happens to the sending rate? Even though our equation says we can, we can send more, but we're still clocking the packets, right? Every time we receive an ACK, we send a packet. Conservation of flow. So we're not able to send more packets. So that's the problem. So what's the solution to this? In a, in a regular TCP, what would happen? You would uh, eventually send enough packets to overflow the buffer 
and you lose a packet and eventually the signal will come back saying you lost a packet and you have to reduce the rate. You could do something differently, right? You could compare the actual rate at which you're sending the packets and the expected rate. And what could you do based on that information? You can go back here. Do you see the difference between actual rate and expected rate? The middle diagram is the actual rate. It's not increasing as much. And at some point, the disparity between the expected rate and the actual rate grows, you know, if it grows beyond a certain threshold, what should you do? What's the right behavior when your sending rate starts flattening? Look at the router diagram as well. What should be the right behavior? That's what you do. And what if um, your actual rate is smaller than the expected rate? Can that happen? Yeah, that's what the first diagram was, right? Your actual rate is smaller than your expected rate. Yeah. But it turns out you want to do things differently depending on the threshold. So if um, E minus A, E is the expected rate, A is the actual rate, if it is greater than certain threshold, you want to slow down. Right? Even though you haven't dropped any packet. What if uh, that difference is small? What if that difference is very small? It might be okay to increase the rate. Basically, you're trying to maintain that difference at a certain level. And as, long as, as soon as that rate, uh, that disparity grows beyond a certain threshold, you want to start decreasing again. So do you understand this particular way of pacing the packets compared to the standard TCP? The big difference is here we are trying to guess, okay, there is an imminent congestion. The queues are building up. The difference between expected rate and actual rate is growing, so we need to slow down. As opposed to standard TCP, we've already lost a packet. Turns out we're already congested. So why is our decrease less aggressive here than standard TCP. It's less aggressive, right? What does TCP decrease? Multiplicative. We reduce it by half. Here it is, could be even be linear. Why, why is it less aggressive? And why is that OK? Because you're not actually hitting a window size where you're going to lose packets. Yes. You don't want to decrease it too much because you haven't lost anything. Right. So you haven't uh, hit the limit yet. So you actually are able to gracefully decrease that. All right, so if you use this algorithm, the queues are going to be shorter than average, right? It's going to be shorter than uh, using standard TCP. Do we, do we see why? Because we're not letting the, the disparity grow too much. We're decreasing the rate even before we hit the limit. There is lower jitter. Why is there lower jitter? So not always cutting the, the rate in half. Yeah, exactly. So we're not always cutting the rate in half, so it's smoother. But it does not compete well with Reno. Why is that? So let's say we wanted to run this algorithm in the same network. We also have the earlier TCP that we talked about. How, how would they interact? So let's imagine we have two clients using the same network. 
The first one uses the standard algorithm that we talked about earlier, which is keep on sending, and once the packet is dropped, reduce it in half. The second client is using this TCP Vegas algorithm, monitoring the actual rate and estimated rate, and reducing the capacity even before you hit the limit. What will happen if you run these two clients together? The clue is right there. But it's your job to understand why. I guess the answer is right there, too. Similar to the UDP problem, right? Yeah. Because the earlier algorithm is going to be a little bit more weak. Yeah. Because Vegas will decrease the rate at which it's sending packets, and that allows Reno to keep on sending the packets because the packets are not going to drop anymore. And how does Vegas perceive that? It says, okay, so the, in, so the difference between estimated and actual rate is actually getting larger. So what, what, is, what is Vegas going to do? It's going to throttle back some more. Yeah. And then Reno sees, hey, there's more bandwidth available. Right. Exactly. Is it clear? Okay. So how do we solve that problem? So maybe... If we make the network smarter, maybe we can solve that problem. We only have 10 minutes, so let's uh, think about how to make the network smarter. The main difference between Vegas and Reno is we're trying to understand okay, when is congestion going to happen and just respond even before it happens. That's, that's what we're trying to do, right? What if we did something in the network to tell the sender that there is an imminent congestion. And what, would, what, what is the minimum that we need to do at the network to provide this signal to the sender? So that's called congestion signaling, right? So the routers, they can tell that there is an imminent congestion just by monitoring their queue sizes. Right? Just like um, what Vegas was doing. Sorry, Vegas was not doing that, but it was trying to indirectly measure that. Right? But the router actually had the most direct information, the queue size. They know exactly how many packets are there in the queue mm -hmm. at a given time. So the idea is, rather than wait for let's say standard TCP to wait until there is a packet drop, because when why does a packet drop happen? There is not enough room in the queue. Rather than wait until that time, have the router give some feedback to the sender. The routers are the elements in the network. Give some feedback to the sender so that they can respond to it. So this is an approach that requires some cooperation from the network as opposed to Vegas. <coughs> Does it require some cooperation from the network? No, because you're measuring the queues building up indirectly. I'll give you one other idea for uh, how you might be able to measure this indirectly. So what happens if you're looking at round trip time and the queues are building up? What happens to round trip time? It increases. Yeah. So perhaps you could even use that as a signal if there is no cooperation from the network. So how would you design a congestion control algorithm? Let's say you're, you're just monitoring round trip time. So what are you going to do if uh, there is an increase in round trip time? Are you going to increase the rate or decrease the rate? And what, what, what are you going to do if the round trip time is uh, really low? Increase the rate. But what's the problem with this? Uh, the, this is not going to work in the real world. You can get fooled by another app. Yeah, there could be many other reasons why the round trip time changes like that, right? But it's probably not worthless information. Perhaps you could use that information in combination with uh, other information to do some, something even smarter. So anyways, getting back to 
the network helping in congestion control. So the idea is the router will tell the sender about any imminent congestion. That's the idea. All right. It's called random early detection. Oh, by the way, I assigned some readings. Uh, you might want to just go take a look at that to uh, understand these mechanisms in a little bit more detail. Unfortunately, I don't think the text textbook has, has uh, some of these topics. That's very unfortunate. Anyway, so on this graph, we have Q length on Y axis and time on X axis. And the black line tells you how long the queue is at a given time. OK? So why, is it, why does it jump up and down like that? Because the packets are bursty. Think about HTTP. Let's say you wanted to plot the number of bytes being transmitted on Y axis and time on X axis. And let's say you're on Facebook page. What does that graph look like? It'll probably just jump up and down. Why is that? Because you're not always requesting information. Yeah, exactly. It's not a long and constant file download, right? OK. The blue line is the average. And you already know how to compute this type of average. Or you will know by Wednesday. OK? <laughs> so even in the homework, you have a similar situation. So you have these signals that might be a little bit bursty, but if you want to get a high-level trend, you might want to compute that average. So once you have that average, you can start thinking about, OK, there is an imminent congestion, there is not. And the way you're going to do that, if you want to use a red algorithm on the routers in the network, is by using a packet marking scheme that is probabilistic. OK, so let's try to parse that. So first, I said packet marking. So TCP uses drops as a signal. So if you're operating in a regime where you haven't even hit the limit, it's not useful, or it's, it's not a good idea to actually drop the packets to tell, the, to tell TCP to slow down. So instead, we're going to mark the packets. And we're going to mark the packets with some probability. And this probability increases. That means you're going to get more and more packets with the, that are marked if we're cl uh, closer and closer to hitting the limit. And if we hit the limit, all the packets are going to be marked. So that's the probabilistic part. So this graph tells you the probability at which you should mark the packets. If the queue size is small, let's say up to some minimum threshold, we're not going to mark any packets. Marking probability is 0. If the queue size, just to be more precise, I should say average queue size, right? if the average queue size is between minimum threshold and maximum threshold, we're going to mark those packets with certain probability. And if the queue size exceeds, or average queue size exceeds maximum threshold, we're going to mark all the packets. So why are we talking about probability here? It has to do with the signaling bandwidth. One way to accomplish the signaling to the sender is just by saying, OK, here's the average queue size. Would that work? I think that's a work, right? But why are we talking about these probabilities here? I'll give you a hint. Let's say you only have one bit of information. Let's say you have the ability to communicate using a single bit. How would you communicate that, OK, here's the average queue size? How would you do that? So you want to tell the sender, OK, here's the average queue size. You need to slow down, et cetera. That's the goal, right? But you only have one bit to do it? Yes. But you only have one bit to do it. Either full or empty. 
Yes. So that's the that's the problem. <laughs> but let's say you have a hundred packets to send, and you want to tell the sender that the average queue size is twenty. Turn twenty of them on. And yeah. Eighty of them off. Exactly. If you'll understand why we're talking about marking and uh, probability as opposed to sending the average queue size. If you have the luxury of one or two bytes of communication or signaling bandwidth, you can just send the average. Right? So why, why are we talking about one bit then in the first place? Probably from the TCP header somewhere. Yeah, so we want to use some of the existing fields in TCP header. And the reason we, want, we don't want this to be too wide is because that's an overhead. Right? Because we're going to have this information on all the packets that we're sending, so it just makes sense to try to minimize the number of uh, bits that we're transmitting. All right. So if a flow is using a lot of capacity, more of its packet is going to be marked. And hopefully the sender uses that as a signal. OK, so now the question is, why do we want to use average and not instantaneous? Because then if you get something that just wants to dump a whole burst of packets and then it's done. Mm -hmm. Then you don't signal to everybody, oh gosh, the network is congested when yeah. it's just a, a quick flow. But again, you're not signaling to everybody, just to that sender. Yeah. But you don't want the sender to slow down because the average utilization for that particular sender is still low, and that sender should have the fair share, right? This is back to the web page example. If someone is downloading just web page and instant that instantaneous burst might be large, but that user is not using a lot of capacity in average. OK? So if we use average, does that solve the problem? The average will still be low, right? The instantaneous sample is large, but the average is small. OK. All right, so finally, one last idea. I promise I will not take more than two minutes. So we talked about red. We're still relying on the sender to do the right thing. And what's the right thing in this case? Let's say a sender is receiving a lot of marked packets. Yeah. By the way, this marking could uh, be sent to the receiver or the sender, depending on exactly how you know, we organize them. The key is marking, right? So we're, we're relying on either the sender or the receiver to do the right thing. Uh, a receiver to do the right thing would be if the receiver receives a lot of data packet that's marked, it has to do something uh, when, or it has to signal the sender in a certain way. Or if the signal is directly going to the sender, the sender has to slow down. That's the right thing, right? So what if uh, they're not willing to do the right thing? We need to enforce something in the network. Right. So the idea is um, we would use multiple queues in the network and we'll enforce the rate at which these queues are allowed to build up. All right. So here are some solutions. I will uh, describe one of these solutions in greater detail next time. But one solution is, uh, let's see if I have a diagram for that. Yeah, OK. So one solution is we have, let's say, flow one and flow two, right? And we queue those packets in separate queues. And then we're going to service one packet from each queue at a time. Does, it, does that make sense to everyone? So there are two clients. They're sending packets. So we're going to grab packet from first queue, transmit. We're going to grab packet from second queue, transmit. And we're going to go back to the first queue and transmit. What's the problem with that? 
So some applications might send large packets. And what happens? So we're not allocating the bandwidth fairly. So we're going to talk about how to make that more fair in the next lecture. All right?